Good evening. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's Distinguished Speaker Series guest, David Taylor. David was born in the great city of Charlotte, North Carolina, and he is an avid supporter of this state and the Duke community. David is a graduate of Duke's Pratt School of Engineering. He serves on the Fuqua Board of Visitors, and David and his wife, Marcia, are the proud parents of over 16 years of Duke tuition. <laughs> David's loyalty and commitment have been a theme throughout his life. He has built an impressive 37-year career at Procter & Gamble. David started out of college on the manufacturing line and has since worked his way to his current position as chairman and CEO. Along the way, David has held positions in product supply and marketing, while also taking international roles in Hong Kong and Geneva. His brand experience extends across multiple categories like Pampers, Head and Shoulders, and Swiffer. As CEO, David has recently navigated activist investor interest and has been directly involved in the company's environmental and social initiatives, including an emphasis on gender equality. David's passion for serving others extends outside of his work at PNG, where he has spent eight years on the board of America's Second Harvest, which is one of the largest food and security nonprofits in the US including two years as chairman. Furthermore, David has worked with Free Store Food Bank, a small local food pantry for over 12 years. As you can tell, David is a true leader of consequence. On behalf of Fuqua, please join me in welcoming Mr. David Taylor. So David, welcome. Welcome back Thank home. You. And it is fantastic to have you so deeply involved with Duke and the business school. And it's a special treat to have you back today. So, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for, for showing up. It's great to see this, this audience here. There must have been free pizza right before or right after. We're not sure which one. <laughs> yeah, I, I smelled some pizza earlier, but um, OK. So, so David. Uh, <laughs> So we, we heard uh, kind of the beginning and, and ending of your career. And I think what's interesting to many people in this room as they're at their more at the front end of their careers or midpoint of their careers is, is thinking through this process of, of how do you get to be CEO? And one of the things that's very clear from your career is that it's not necessarily a linear vertical no. climb. And so, uh, so you started off in the, on the manufacturing side of things, and what was your dream job? I started as a shift team manager in Greenville, North Carolina, and my aspiration then was to one day be the plant manager of that whole facility. That sounded like a really cool thing to do. And so you were a, you were a fast riser in that world, and you did become a plant manager. Mm -hmm. Nine years later. Nine years later. Four moves later, four plants later, yes. Plant manager. And then you made a decision to, to go backwards in your career. So, mm -hmm. so tell me, why, why did you decide to step back instead of continuing to go down the path you were on? I enjoyed the manufacturing role a great deal. The people there were wonderful. Uh, it was technically challenging. It was a, 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 an opportunity to build a large organization. It was over 1,000 people. But during that assignment, I got to see a little bit more about the total company. As a plant manager, you got to go to Cincinnati and see and some of the, the uh, company meetings, the commercial side of the business. So I was, that's the first time I was exposed in a meaningful way to marketing, to sales, to the broader business community. And it was very interesting to me. I was curious about consumers and customers. And one of the senior managers visited the plant one time and said, what would you like to do long term? I said, I'd love the chance one day to lead one of these businesses for the US, which in our company at that time would have been a vice president. Uh, and he said, okay, that's good. If you'd like to do that, though, you need to really understand consumers and customers and marketing and brand building. And the best way to do that is to start as an assistant brand manager, which for those of you that are interviewing is the entry level position for a marketing organization. I was 11 years with the company. I was a plant manager of 1,200 folks. You're a big fish in a little pond. And if then you want to, I'll go back and start with other new hires in marketing. Uh, and I said, yes. And, and it was frankly a wonderful decision, even though the first year was probably the biggest lesson in humility I've ever had, because you come back and, and, and you're, 
you move from being leading and knowing to learning, and it was a fundamental life lesson, which is those that stay in the learning mode, to me, position themselves very well to advance. Those that start to believe they know limit the opportunity to learn from others. So by going back as an assistant brand manager, I had the ability to learn without putting the company at risk or putting my career at risk. And it was just, it was fabulous to learn quickly about the consumer and the customer. I spent 30 days at an agency training in New York as a creative. I'm an engineer by training. A creative was an out-of-body experience for me. Uh, <laughs> I learned very clearly that I would never be a creative and came out with great respect for what the creatives did. I understand and understood and got to see a very non-linear way to think. When we got stuck on a project, they'd say, let's stop. And we'd go walk around Central Park. And I'd say, don't we have work to do? And they'd say, we'll come back and get to it, and we may work that night. But I got to see people that got to a wonderful outcome in a very different way than I did. So that entire first few years, to me, gave me a wonderful foundation on consumers, then did sales training. Uh, and to me, became an accelerator for the rest of my career. So one of the things that, that you picked up uh, along the way is really outstanding communication skills. And, and you seem to understand that communication is more than just speaking. In fact, you, you once told me something that I've never forgotten, which is something that you'll say to others if, if you don't think they're really paying attention, which is, are you listening or are you waiting to speak? speak. Yes, absolutely. And, and think about for, for everybody here, when you're in a conversation, how much of your time is formulating your next response versus thoughtfully listening to what you're asking so that I could try to at least answer your question or try on the idea you're sharing. And, it, and it, the fundamental, what underpins to me the belief in that is a, a concept called integrative thinking. And that is there's often a better third way. Most of us want to win an argument. And so what we're doing is formulating our response to win. The reverse way is to say, I'm gonna understand why you got to the conclusion you did because I respect you and believe you're very smart. And so if you've got a different opinion than I do, I could probably benefit from understanding how you got to where you, you've arrived. And that often means walking down your ladder of inference to find out what data or experiences you accessed. And think about the benefit to me if I surround myself with people different from me and I have, the, the, to me, the intelligence to listen to them, I then have this tremendous pool of both facts and experiences I can access to make a better decision instead of trying to do just what I've done. Because the, what I've learned throughout my assignments as I move to different assignments is how little I know and how much collectively we can get done. None of us are smarter than all of us. And the best leaders I've ever worked with are the ones that tapped into the combined capability of those around them. And with that, they made great decisions, and it often pulls you in, and you want to help somebody that truly listens to you. So you actually wrote a, a blog post recently with mm -hmm. that, that very title, None yep. of Us is Smarter None Than smart all, of us. all of Us. And, yes. um, and so when, when did that really start to come home for you as, as a mantra mm -hmm. to, to, to live by? Yeah. Two big, to me, experiences that, that drove it home. One is early in my career when I was in manufacturing, at third shift the line would go down. When the line would go down at 2 a.m., you had to get it up and running. And I was on in a production line that had many very junior employees with a wide range of skills. And none of us had all the skills. Collectively, we could solve almost anything. And then what really drove it home is when the company asked me to leave the marketing assignment I was in in the U.S. and go be a general manager of a hair care business in Greater China. Never been in the hair care business, never been to Greater China, never been a vice president. Said, this has just got to work. This is wonderful, good career planning. So I landed there, <laughs> and, and what quickly happened was I realized I had certain skills, and collectively the rest of the team had different skills. They knew the language, they knew the culture, they knew the customers. I knew a good bit about the business. I knew a good bit about bringing groups of people together. And we were able to, to, to me, do very well together very quickly. And it illustrated once again that if you tap into the collective experiences of the team, you can accomplish amazing things pretty quickly and bring the team together with you. You know, you, what you want to do is elevate the people that you work with, and what happens is they help elevate your performance as well. It's, it's become clear that there may be expectations around a, a CEO to take positions on social issues <laughs> yes. or political issues in different ways. You've been, uh, 
you, you've been more, I would say, proactive than reactive around some of these issues. You have mm -hmm. a real, it was mentioned in your introduction, you have a real passion for gender equity. Mm -hmm. You've been very engaged in, in terms of uh, thinking about some of the, the, the racial issues mm -hmm. that we've been facing in this country. And so um, I'm gonna ask that we show a clip uh, called The Talk. If you could run that, and then I'm gonna ask you yes. about where this okay. comes from. Who said that? The lady at the store. That is not a compliment. Listen, it's an ugly, nasty word, and you are gonna hear it. Nothing I can do about that. But you are not gonna let that word hurt you. You hear me? There are some people who think you don't deserve the same privileges just because of what you look like. It's not fair. It's not. Remember, you can do anything they can. The difference is you gotta work twice as hard and be twice as smart. Come straight home after practice. You got your ID? Guess I stopped you. How's your review? We're good. You good? Yeah, you see? We're good. Okay. Good. Now, when you get pulled over, um, I'm a good driver. Okay. Baby, don't worry. This is not about you getting a ticket. This is about you not coming home. I'm gonna be okay. Right? Okay. Okay. Baby. It's not fair. But you keep showing up. You are not pretty for a black girl. You are beautiful, period. Okay? Don't ever forget that. That's, a, that's an incredibly powerful and emotional clip. Mm -hmm. Tell me, why did that happen? Where did that come from? Uh, the, the underpinning of, of a lot of our efforts in this space, it comes from our, we've created a, an effort called My Black is Beautiful. And it's part of an effort we want to better serve African-American consumers in this country. Uh, and as we've done, what we do in all of our efforts is go and listen and learn there's dialogues that occur that many of us don't experience. I don't experience it. Um, and what we wanted to do is to have a spot that, that to be a stimulated conversation, because what we believe is dialogue leads to understanding. Understanding can lead to change attitudes, and that can change behavior, and ultimately that could lead to action. There's a lot of things that have happened in the country over the last couple years uh, that I think call everybody to question the whole idea of unconscious bias, and it's not just African Americans, it's gender, across many different dimensions of diversity. And where we can, we want to build our brand, but also use our voice in a way that, that stimulates positive dialogue. This stimulated dialogue, uh, I've got some very strong in both on this one. Uh, there was a strong reaction, generally very positive, because so many people say this is real. And there's many people that say, no, it's not. It's, but if the people that say it wasn't real weren't, weren't living the life that we tried to depict. They weren't African-American. They often had come out of a life of privilege or just a different set of experiences. Uh, so that triggered dialogue. And what we've seen since then is a tremendous positive outpouring, probably you know, vast majority positive, because what it did was it just opened up another area for us to learn, learn about each other in a different way, that hopefully leads to better relations and advancing uh, dialogue. And a byproduct is it does build the brand. My black is beautiful and it says you understand. And that's true for everything we try to do. You wanna start with serving the consumers, which is understanding him or her as they live their life and say, how do you add some value to that with a product or package that addresses a need 
or in some cases by using your voice. This is an example for anybody that's seen any of our Like a Girl advertising, not always. It's another one that addresses some of the area in gender equality and specifically how often teenage girls see a drop in confidence. And it's because a lot of terms we use in everyday life, oh, you throw like a girl, you do this like a girl, and it's used in a very negative context. And we did some research and ran some advertising, and it changed how they viewed that. It went from like 15 to 18%, viewed it positive to 75%. And we tried to hero and feature just a number of high school girls in a variety of different settings, and then done some Olympic spots, or spots for the Olympics. And what we've seen is a really positive response, and it built our Always brand. So the idea is to tap into real social issues and try to advance in a constructive way without getting political, just being it's more on real human dialogue. Do we have the, the Like a Girl? Uh, There's a Like clip? a Girl spot. It's, it's a really, and this is what we did this. with a, a company, Walmart, and it, it brings up again another very real dynamic. So watch this if you would, and there's a comment on it. What I'd like to tell you about my junior high girls basketball team is that they rock. They're intelligent and beautiful and they can do anything as long as they know people believe in them. In 14 years, they've never had a brand new set of uniforms. I'm duct taping their shorts to them to make sure when they get on the court that they don't drop to their ankles. Our locker rooms are sort of small, so we all pretty much have to sit on the floor. They're not really thought about. They don't get fans out to watch them. It would mean a lot if people came to support us because we need that support. And we look to our family and everything to cheering us on. By the time it's all said and done, they really think that nobody cares about them. experience and I feel more confident about myself when I play. So as you as you produced spots like these, did you receive criticism to say, why aren't you focused on selling more products? You know, let, yeah. let's get right to the point. Growth is the imperative, and, yes, yeah. and you're you're not you're getting distracted by social issues. Yes, yeah. I even had one one question in, in one of our shareholders meetings uh, along that lines. But the interesting thing is this advances understanding on a societal issue while it builds the business. Always has grown share. Always is done very well, especially after we launch a new ad because it just furthers the conversation. We've had a tremendous following on social media. You've had another number of thought leaders just share it with their audiences. Uh, the Walmart uh, joint promotion did well for Walmart as well. We've now done a gym in every state. Uh, we find, found a high school and, and generally picked one and, and converted it. So uh, the one that generated the most polarized comments was the talk because it, it's, it's, it's just a tough issue. It's tough to talk about race in this country. And, and to open up a dialogue, it's just very awkward. And there's some people that really took offense at that, really took offense. Some of the harshest letters I've ever received came after we aired that. Uh, but we, we, we would constructively respond back. In fact, uh, the chief diversity officer of the company was fabulous because 
uh, he walked toward the barking dog. He said if somebody really had a, just a visceral reaction, he would send a note or call him. He said, can we sit down and talk? And it was amazing how it just lowered the temperature and he got into a dialogue because people expected to argue back. And instead, what we try to do is engage and engage and roll people. Then people can make up their own mind. But we are about building our business first. First and foremost, Proctor is a consumer products company and we're looking to build our business. But we also believe in today's world, consumers are looking for the company behind the brand. What are the values of the company behind the brand? And we have values that we feel very strongly about and we've decided to start to express those in ways that make sense. We've done this in India with a powerful campaign. Uh, we've done this in China on some really social stigma around uh, women that aren't married at 25, they're called leftover women. We ran a very powerful spot, just talked about people making choice and, and celebrating the choices they make. And it's got a, just an enormously positive response and it grew the brand. And first priority is to grow the brand, but there's a way to do that in a constructive way. We'll still do side by side. So anybody that's disappointed, they won't see a side by side. There'll be plenty of those because we want to convey the superiority of performance. But we also believe what a brand stands for matters more than it has in the past. So uh, you've been, you're actually on the steering committee uh, of this group, CEO Action for Diversity and yes. Inclusion. So tell me, tell me what that's about and, mm -hmm. and why that's important uh, for CEOs to come together on this. Certainly, Tim Ryan, I give credit to uh, PwC, has done a wonderful job kind of being the galvanizing leader in this. And then he talked to a number of us right after some of the terrible incidents of a couple of years ago uh, where some African-American, uh, both men and women, had been shot, but mainly men had been shot. Um, and we talked about, again, the dialogue that occurred in our companies after that. And we said, while these things occurred outside our companies, People still experience it and they come inside the company and they're, they're difficult to talk about. So we wanted to create dialogue in our companies. So uh, there were, I think there were eight companies in the initial group. Uh, we said we would share best practices, what we're doing. And, and we had one of our leaders, our chief marketing officer and our chief diversity officer both led some dialogues, created a forum where people would talk about how they feel because you don't check your emotions at the door. And what it became was just a wonderful way again to learn. And so coming out of that, uh, and again, led by Tim, but the group said, let's see if we can't get a coalition of CEOs that want to share best practices and agree collectively, we will do unconscious bias training. There's some wonderful training out available on unconscious bias, which we all have. We all have biases. We have a set of experiences and we see things through our lens. And the unconscious bias just opens up your field of vision to potentially see different realities. And so we use this catalyst to try to drive some again positive change. And we started with eight, then it went 15, 20, 50. I think there are 400 companies now that have signed on. We've now had a couple meetings. We've gotten together to share best practices. And again, this, this unconscious bias training. But the idea is that corporate America can really make a difference. We employ millions of people. And if we can create a safe place in our companies, where people can talk about these difficult issues, we're gonna have a more productive workforce. It's genuine and it's authentic conversations, but make it okay to talk about these things that have almost been taboo to talk about, whether it's race, which is one of the hardest, or other areas on gender equality, or any of the other areas that you can look at, the Hispanic, uh, LGBTQ, LGBTQ, any of these, make it okay to talk about it, because. Our belief in our company, everybody ought to, va ought to be valued, everybody ought to be included, and everybody ought to have the culture, the environment that allows them to contribute at their peak. That's not true, either in companies or in society, and we can get better. And we said, let's work together to get better. This is an area that was, is not one that we said, we're gonna try to compete with each other. Let's work together on this, and then compete on the strategies of our company. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears back to your introduction where it was mentioned that, that you've been up close and personal with activist investing. <laughs> yes. Uh, very, very public uh, engagement. Yes. And so having gone through that, what, what lessons can you share with us around how, how you get the best out of this and, uh, and not get stuck with the things that, that can be uh, the, a downfall? Uh. First, the first thing I've, I've reinforced to everybody in the company, the best way to not to have an activist is deliver better results. Uh, and it's true, activists generally come in when a company is underperformed for some period of time, but they think there's an upside. 
They're looking for a chance to see a meaningful inflection to make money. So the first message to me and to all of the company is over a period of time, we did not perform as well as we needed to. And it was a, an extended period of time for lots of reasons. But at the end of the day, message one. Uh, the second was uh, we did choose to fight it. It was an expensive and very time consuming proxy fight. But coming out of that, uh, during the process, uh, myself, the CFO, and several members of our board, and several other members, our chief legal officer, uh, visited lots of our investors. And the silver lining out of a very difficult six months was we heard from a wide range of big individual investors as well as institutions about what they liked. And the message we heard is we like the strategy, we think it's on track, but we'd like to see faster action. And when we got down to the vote, it was pretty close to 50-50. We may have gotten a few more votes at the end, but there was a clear message there. And instead of declaring victory and moving on and having Nelson on the outside saying you're not listening, we said we had a, a very constructive talk inside the board. And then uh, I had several conversations with Nelson Peltz and said, if there's a way we can work together, then it makes sense to invite you on the board. And, and he was reasonable and, and we decided that was in the best interest of all of us. So we invited him on the board and said, you know, we will create open dialogue. All board members have the chance to express their point of views and we'll, we'll work through whatever the issues are. And whatever's in the boardroom will stay in the boardroom. So we won't talk about what the boardroom's like, but I tell you, that it's again, dialogue is powerful. Listening on what's the real message. I may not agree with the action step or how he would do it, but many of the objectives, I don't disagree. Do I want to see the company grow faster? Yes. Do I see a role for small brands? Absolutely. Do I see a role for some of the other points he'd make? Yes. The specific way that he may have articulated it? No. But we decided we'd be better to bring them on board and, and work and have constructive dialogue in, inside the boardroom, which is what we've done. So P&G is, is one of the iconic companies in the world, and that, that does put you in the spotlight in, in all yes, kinds I've of ways. Uh, and so the, and you, you keep hearing this drumbeat of growth, where's, where's growth? Yes. And so what's, what's going to be the, the, the magic? You've had, uh, mm -hmm. for the past uh, six months or so, the markets have responded favorably to your plans. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what does this growth model look like going forward? Yeah, what we've articulated publicly, which is all I can certainly talk about here, uh, which I very much believe in, is it's based on truly refocusing on what drove the company to success, which is we need to be meaningfully better on the products, the packages, our go-to-market capability, the communication or brand equity, and then one we weren't doing as well is both consumer value and customer value. What has changed amongst many things in the marketplace is the dynamics for our customers dramatically change. Retail industry is being disrupted. We could talk about that a good while on what's happening with on, you know, pure players coming in online, both here, China, and many other places, and the profit pools under pressure. So most retailers are demanding, and it's a reasonable request. They're making it very clear, which is there's two things we want leading companies to do. Grow our categories and grow our profit because they're under pressure. So we had to improve in category and in, in customer value specifically, and we're addressing that. And we had to increase the advantage we had in some of the other metrics on product performance uh, or packaging or go-to-market capability. And as we've done that, we've seen a real inflection. I go back two years ago, our China business was minus 5%. That's not good. The market's growing, and there's lots of reasons. There's been an explosion of brands. 300 new brands were launched in hair care alone in China last year. So even if they get a small amount, coming in from everywhere. As we've refocused on this and gotten back to doing those five things really well and use productivity to fund it, we've gone from minus five two years ago to plus one last year to plus seven this last year. So a clear step up. So it, it demonstrates when we deliver that, but it requires us to move faster. What took two years before needs to take nine months. The, it needs to be real time. You know, and I've spent a good bit of time in Silicon Valley and in China. and, and the, the clock speed of competitions moved up. When we move, and we are gonna move at that speed, and take advantage of the tremendous capabilities, the brand portfolio we have is amazing. The go-to-market capability, there's scale advantages, but scale can talk you into centralizing and getting slow. 
We had to get back to getting in touch with consumers and customers and be market focused. We will win in every market in every country. And to do that means you better be superior and be agile. And we have to reorganize our company to be able to do that. And all that does take time. But as they say in golf, there's no room for description on the scorecard. You get a little block and we've got to deliver the results, which is top, bottom, cash, gross share, and do it in an ethical way that leaves our organization able to repeat that the following year, so a healthy organization. So we've gotten very clear, and you know, I'm confident that the P&G people will rise to the occasion. So speaking of the, the P&G people, uh, again, the, there's a long tradition of developing talent from yes. within P&G, and, and yet there are all kinds of changes going on in the world, so how do you balance the, the need to continue to create opportunity, growth, and development for your team with the idea of, well, there's some stuff going on out there that we need to bring in. Yes. And does that change the way you approach the you know, organizational uh, talent uh, development and, and yeah. uh, retention and attraction? It's a great question because it's one that we have historically been almost exclusively a promote from within company. The number of my competitors that are X, P, and G is considerable. I can produce a list of, I think, 50 CEOs or presidents of divisions in the last 20 years or so that are out in industry across many. Uh, so that, that development system works. Uh, on the other hand, there are some areas, either businesses or capabilities, where things have happened in the marketplace really fast, and we can develop them within, but that takes time, or we can acquire it. So my belief is we'll stay with a develop-focused mindset on developing the people we have, but where there's been primarily in the past one on-ramp, which is generally out of universities, and, and with some exceptions, but mainly out of universities, we want more on-ramps, which is IT, information security. We've hired a number of experienced people because, frankly, the best knowledge was outside our company to bring in and accelerate our growth. But once you come into the company, it's a develop, develop from within organization, but we can supplement with outside experience that accelerates our progress. We've done some significant outside hires across many levels and in many different businesses, and it's making us a better company. We're not abandoning the commitment to people that start with our company to invest in their development at all levels. On the other hand, we believe we can accelerate our results and our development by bringing in people that have skills that will expose us to a broader range of capabilities. So you've, you've mentioned that, uh, that it's much better to have people who are, are humble, who don't have big egos, uh, and are interested in, in learning continuously. One of the things that the people fear when, when they don't always kind of call attention to themselves is they'll be missed. How, how, does, how is it that P&G nurtures the, the kind mm -hmm. of talent that you think is going to be most valuable and values that talent when they're not constantly singing their own praises? Yeah, again. First, I believe excellence gets noticed everywhere. So I think generally when, when people feel they have to tout what they do, I think it causes a lot of other people to put their guard up. So actually, I think it backfires more than it helps in many organizations. Uh, my experience in P&G throughout my career is those that deliver strong results and do it in a way that lifts the people around them, that leverages and taps into the talents of people around them, do well. I've been on nonprofit boards, I've been on profit boards, and I've experienced the same thing. It is the individual that is in service to the organization, but truly makes a meaningful impact. So it doesn't mean you just have to cooperate. It's not, you know, collaborate and go along with it and, and you'll get ahead. No, because you're not standing out. It has to be meaningful track record of achievement and done in a way that develops those around them, because that's another form of contribution. We have a lens within the company that we look at the organizational impact as well as the hard number impact. Both matter because the, the first, the organizational impact, is what's going to help next year's results. And I do look, when we look for promotion candidates at higher levels, at, did we get talent come out of their organization that was made available to the rest of the company? All those things tell me that somebody is having an impact on the ability today with the results they deliver and tomorrow with the talent they develop. Um, Again, I, I believe excellence stands out. Mediocrity can get lost. So do you think that the, that the role of the corporation has, has fundamentally changed in, in recent years, that, that there are more responsibilities kind of coming back to these themes you were mm -hmm. talking about before? Um, or, or is it just that you have to deliver the shareholder value and keep your employees happy? 
What, what, what do you think has changed in terms of your responsibility to, to P&G and the people you serve and all your stakeholders? Yeah, I, th I think, again, you know, I know there's different views on this, and, and that's fine on what is the role of a corporation. Is it to exclusively uh, serve and create value for your shareholders, which is a fundamental responsibility, or is it broad to a broader group of stakeholders? My personal view, and certainly the Procter & Gamble view, is there's a broader responsibility to more stakeholders. It starts with making sure you do serve your shareholders and deliver value over time. Over time. But there's a broader group of stakeholders that includes your employees. It includes other stakeholders like the communities in which we operate. It includes the environment, the resources we tap into. And to me, the broader group in suppliers and customers and how you interact with them. And so I think there's a responsibility to a broader group of stakeholders, starting with your shareholders. But when it's exclusively to shareholders, to me, to me there are some very serious consequences to the long-term capability of an organization to create value. So I actually believe it is the best value-creating strategy if you're worried about five, 10, 20 years. If you're worried about three to five years, to me, you can focus exclusively on the financial results of a company. I believe to sustain that, you better be operating in a way that's respectful of employees, communities, the world's resources. And now there's starting to be even, to me, a consequence if you don't do that on many of these. You know, there's extended producer uh, use taxes coming up in many countries for waste. So PNG has been very proactive in working with a variety of organizations to address plastic waste, to find ways to recycle, reuse. Even things like diapers that go to landfill, we've developed with another company uh, a, a process to be able to reclaim them and we'd have to work through municipal, uh, and we've got, actually got a test going to collect, sanitize, and create a value stream coming out of it so it doesn't go to landfill. But the idea is to find solutions to many of these problems because it's right for the business for 10 years from now and that's starting to move up because governments, regulators are starting to create penalties for those that don't take their responsibility to address some of society's problems. Okay. All right, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm gonna turn it over to the audience. Um, and so this question was actually slipped to me, which is um, if you could only eat in one restaurant for the oh, rest gosh. of your life, <laughs> Which Cracker Barrel would it be? <laughs> I won't even address that because can, you can guess where that one might have come from. And they're on one of these, one of these first couple rows in their second year at Fuqua. They may not make the last semester, though, <laughs> <laughs> unless they can run faster than I can, which they can, so they'll probably be here. Uh, yeah, the, the story behind that is we lived international for a number of years. Uh, we lived in, in Hong Kong and then lived in Geneva. And when I'd come back, especially when we lived in China, <laughs> Cracker Barrel was the comfort food. I'd land at an airport and go to the nearest Cracker Barrel. <laughs> and for some reason, that got noted by uh, some mo no folks in the family, and they decided to disclose that to a few of our closest friends today. <laughs> <laughs> so you were born in Charlotte, after all. So, yes, I was. Uh, it's just good home cooking. So questions from the audience? <laughs> There we go, over there. Somebody. The microphone right here, yeah. The microphone up there, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Kaylin Simmons. Um, I wanted to say thank you for sharing the My Black is Beautiful campaign. I think I'm your target customer and I loved it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> two questions. Sorry for being greedy. Um, the first question is, can you share your thoughts on how companies that value diversity and inclusion create a competitive advantage for themselves? Okay. And then the second question would be, what piece of advice would you give the students here that are looking to enter companies um, to sort of navigate unconscious bias and combat it in their respective companies? So Perfect. thank you in advance. Thank, thank you. They're both great questions. First on diversity and inclusion. Both of these are important. Diversity is about having presence of people of difference, and it can be almost any lens. But diversity alone, not addressed, actually can cause disruption in a company. There's a model, which I really believe in, that says homogenous teams to start, tend to start off stronger. People are, tend to be more alike. They listen. They come together quickly. But they tend to tap out earlier. Diverse teams tend to start bumpy. There's lots of different ideas, different perspectives, different lens. If you can pull it together and create the environment where you can li listen to everybody, this whole idea of not waiting to speak, of listening, they tend to outperform and significantly outperform teams because the access 
many more experiences and often a broader range of capability. Many companies are making progress in diversity. To me, often the harder part is creating an inclusive environment where people feel they can bring their genuine self to work each and every day. And that's one of the things we're working very hard on, not just presence of diversity, which is important, and frankly, there's a lot of room for corporate America to improve, but it's creating the environment where you activate that diversity to both advance the company, but also create a much, much more vibrant, dynamic culture. So I think it's very powerful, and I do believe it's absolutely a source of competitive advantage, because you think of a company like P&G, five billion consumers this year will buy a P&G product. Five billion consumers, almost. That's a lot of people. And what I want is a leadership team that's reflective of the people we serve, because they'll have more empathy for the consumers. We'll find out how to connect with them. Not sell to them, but connect to them, when and where they're receptive in a way that's respectful. And to me, if I have a diverse leadership team that's reflective of the people we serve, the ability for our company to connect with those consumers, to me, goes up significantly. As far as when somebody's joining a company, uh, you will all likely be much more in touch with diversity and inclusion in working in, in, in teams that are very different. One of the things that I think, Dean Bolden, you do and your, your whole staff and administration do a wonderful, wonderful job is, is creating an environment where it's not just about me and getting ahead. It's, this is an amazing academic institution, but it's also a place that employers see you can get people that actually have EQ, IQ, and you call it the decency quotient. I think all of those are very important. The leaders of consequence is real. That's not a slogan, that is real. And what companies want is people that are gonna make a difference. Beyond just being really smart, there's a lot of really smart people. People that are smart that can work with folks, respectfully interact with those that are subordinate to whatever level they're in, their peers, their bosses, and other stakeholders. And to me, you bring, likely, a better suite of skills, more empathy on how to work with people that are different from you, which I think companies really value. The one other piece I'd say is please don't discount your ability to contribute in your ideas day one. You have a gift that companies like P&G really value, which is fresh eyes. If you come to a company and there's something that really doesn't look like it makes any sense, it probably doesn't make any sense, but we've got compensating systems to navigate around it. I love it when somebody comes in and says, David, do you realize we do this? It's really an inefficient way. And then, please, and here's a better way, and I'd like to help make that happen. The last part is what really distinguishes people, people that see issues and say, here's an issue. I'd like to work on addressing it as opposed to bring a problem to somebody. So I think you, you, you all have very capable backgrounds. You wouldn't be in the school if you weren't achievement oriented. You wouldn't be here if you weren't smart and able to work with teams. Those that really start fast are the ones that are willing to jump in, contribute, and have enough self-confidence to be able to express their point of view and then be the first one that steps up. As, as one of the things John Pepper, one of our former CEOs and chairmen, and just a wonderful man, once told me early in his career, he said, David, when they were, at, you know, they were looking for somebody to lead the United Way campaign or a, an arts fund drive or some other organizational effort, he said, I was always the person that stood forward where everybody was looking at their shoes. He said, the reason I did that was it gave me a couple real benefits. One, I made a contribution, often got noticed. Secondly, I met people that built my network. And third, I showed the organization I had the capacity to do my job and something more. And so, and he's now, he's done that his whole career, he's retired and he's still in service to society. Just a wonderful role model. So, Please don't discount the immediate impact you can have and make whomever you join better. Thank you. Um, thanks for your time, and I really appreciate uh, the meaningful and insightful comments uh, that we're hearing. Um, we heard that uh, you talked about uh, the um, adoption of technology and, and, uh, and especially the new technologies that are out there, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Yes. Um, what's your take and what's, how would you define innovation uh, within PNG? And, and why, why would you think that that is something that the future leaders here should focus on? Um, and also what's, um, how PNG is looking at uh, managing different types of innovation so that it can stay at par with the market? Okay, it's a big question, probably many facets. Just a couple things on innovation. One, 
many think of innovation as cool tech, uh, and that does matter, and certainly we leverage a number of different tools, because in addition to the consumer products we have, we have a number now of devices, smart devices, because it gives us information on how to better serve the consumer. You'll find smart toothbrushes and a number of other categories now. There's no lay skin advisor where you can take a picture of your skin and get a diagnosis and, and products that will better serve you. And there's all kinds of capability being built you know, that can be activated with a mobile phone. And we're working with amazing partners, many of the tech firms in the US and in China and around the world. But to me, there's a broader opportunity on innovation for companies like P&G, which is to innovate on the business model and innovate on any of the five aspects of superiority that I mentioned, product package, go-to-market capability, communication, or how to create value with customers or consumers. And what we want to create, and frankly, another area that I think you're, this, this institution prepares people very, very well to be an immediate contributor, is, is the time frame of innovation to me has moved much, much faster. And the way innovation is done in big companies in the past is big teams, multifunctional, get a big budget, you know, you'd have quarterly targets. And the way it operates now and the way we're moving is much more to what's often called lean innovation. Small teams, identify an outcome, give them a lot of license and very little money. And the idea is let them go learn fast, run experiments. You know, you got an idea on Friday, run an experiment over the weekend, get a minimum viable prototype, get it out there, learn about it, and go and do it yourself. We said we want eyes on the consumer, hands on the keyboard, and go. And to me, you can innovate in every aspect of your business. So we want innovative people, whatever we put them on a brand or a segment, innovate, make it better. And so, uh, and, and what we're doing, and it's one of the, to me, unique gifts we have because of our size and scale, uh, we've been able to access almost any company. Uh, we just had an event this summer that we call Signal. We bring in thought leaders across a variety of different fields that are disrupting fields. So we had everybody from uh, CEOs and founders of large firms. Last year we had Daniel Zhang, CEO of Alibaba, on stage. We've had the CEO of many of the firms that are now billionaires before they were billionaires and in their hoodie in the 20s. And, and they've come and talked about any of a variety of different businesses. And then we get a chance to interact with them. We've had certainly leaders of Facebook, Google, and many of others uh, we had the CEO of YouTube this time talking. We had uh, the CEO and founder of Pinterest. Uh, we've had Chinese entrepreneurs. And, and the idea is to expose our organization and then where it makes sense, build the relationship so that we can get small teams to work with them. Whether it's with Verily at Google that's doing some really cool stuff to a number of firms in China, to a number of firms in Europe. Uh, there's so much innovation going on and I don't want to confine what we can do as a company to what we can do inside. It's, again, we're not paid for what we do, we're paid for what we can make happen in the marketplace. And it's one of the first things you really need to learn is that the impact you can have is far greater than what your personal work effort can be if you can tap into others. And it can be technology partners, it can be teammates. Small teams, small amount of money, tight time frames gets amazing things done. Please. Thank you so much for uh, coming to speak with us, taking the time out of your busy schedule. So my question is, um, we actually have an entire class on navigating organizations next semester. So as someone who's obviously done very well in that, um, how would you say you move up in an organization where you have a lot of competition for roles and how do you be competitive while also being collaborative and helping others reach their full potential as well? Okay, good. Again, to advance in companies, I, I really do believe it, it is a level of achievement that stands out and the way it's accomplished. And, and, and we and many companies do, you know, whether it's 360 feedback or just a cross section of the organization on what your impact was. And we do that starting relatively early in one's career because it's important what someone does and how they get it done to me in our company and I think in, in most organizations. I, again, people have often said is, is, you know, people are super competitive and they, you know, they wanna withhold information. I do not see that. I didn't experience it when I moved from manufacturing into our brand group. What I saw was folks that had a ton to do and worked with each other. And generally, if we do our job right, will have people own certain areas and then work with others on other responsibilities. So there is some, some aspect that you're leading the thinking, but you're working with other people to get it done. And, and generally, relatively quickly, you can see how well people interact with others and what their impact is 
and results that they've delivered. Uh, you have to be, though, comfortable if you're looking for very quick uh, affirmation and you're looking for individualistic kind of quick rewards, many big companies aren't the best. There's other places to go for that. Having said that, uh, I, if I look across our company, the people that are exceptional tend to move up quickly because those that are leading them can see. They work close enough to level up or the level two levels up can see. And what you want to do is advance those that have the capacity to contribute and build the organization. It's in their best interest. So there's to be a vested self-interest to find those that are outstanding and give them bigger responsibilities. Just a track record of achievement. And I think that's true of a wide range of companies. Track record of achievement done in a way that to me builds the capability of the organization. Others? Okay, yes. Where? <laughs> If you could stand up, I can't tell where it comes from. <laughs> thank you. Okay, good. Thanks. Hi, thank you so much. It was great listening to you. So my question is more on the digital disruptions. You mentioned that we're partnering with all these Google, Facebook, Google, Amazon. So what other strategies are you following within PNG to make sure you're able to disrupt and use, catalyze a huge growth driver that it's a great question because we, we've got our share of misses and some successes. Today, our, we're, we're, we've got, in our industry, we have, we have the largest e-commerce uh, business of any in our industry, and we've had several businesses that have been widely communicated that fell behind. You know, our, our shave care business is one where uh, several online competitors took a significant chunk of business out, and we were late addressing that. There was an unmet consumer need. It was difficult to address because it was very expensive at first, and, and what we have to acknowledge, and it's very real, is much of the competition, in many cases, does not make money initially. They're funded by private equity, they're trying to grow, it's a sales-driven business model, and then an exit. But it's real, there's right, wrong, and real. That's real, we have to address it. And there's a group of consumers that wanted what they were providing, and so we said, you've gotta go address it. And if it costs money in the short run, but it retains our brand users, then get after it. And, and after what happened on the Dollar Shave Club, you're seeing across P&G's portfolio, both in the US, now in Europe, and in China, a, a much more responsive set of actions, both online, offline, and omni-type experiences, working with our retailers, as well as leveraging technology. So whether that's Olay, whether that's uh, now what we're doing with Gillette across many countries in the world, is making sure we're showing up when and where consumers want to shop, period and we're making sure we're not waiting for somebody to disrupt, we're being disruptive ourselves in many industries. So you're seeing performance marketing, one-to-one -one mass communication, leveraging databases that we've either established or worked with some partners. And in many of those areas, it may not be as profitable initially as our existing business because there's some added expense, but we have to worry about continuing to build users every year on each of our brands. So household penetration is one of the key focuses. You want to build your equity, build household penetration, and over time grow faster than the market. And to me, that's, it's doable, it's very challenging, because the number of competitors that are entering our categories are enormous. Just last year, over 300 new hair care brands in China. We've still got 40 plus share of the business in China. We've got a portfolio of five brands. If we don't have a brand that can serve a segment well, create it, buy it, do what you need to do, but address the business problem. And so in some cases, we've now bought a few companies because they either had capability, people, or brand that to me was needed in order to address serving the consumers in that category. But for all the leaders, they understand the, the objective is to create value for our shareholders via better serving the consumers. And if there's a business model challenge, then come up with an innovative solution. Okay, we have time for one last question. Here we go, right behind you. Sorry, I was in the blind spot. Um, thank you for taking the time to be here. As a leader in an organization, very large organization, how do you get feedback from very different levels uh -huh. to in building, building your strategy, and how do you communicate it back to ensure that it reaches to the mass so everybody's on board to drive into your vision that you have for the company? It, 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 to me, it's also a great question. The second part of that is relatively easy. The first part is very hard. Uh, it's easy to talk that way, it's hard to get it back. 
uh, just because of the dynamics in a big company. We're a company of you know, almost 100,000 people spread across 100 countries. We have on the ground operations in 70. On the second part, which is the easy part, what I do is I do a lot of town halls uh, or global webcasts. And, and I've changed it from a one way standing on stage presenting to walking out, taking questions from anybody and try to create or eliminate the distance, the title, leave the business card at the door. This is David, somebody that's been with this company for a lot of years, and we have a common interest. We want to grow this company. And so if I can address your question and it helps you do a better job, wonderful. And any question is okay. I got a question from one of the plants. Can you explain how it makes sense, your salary versus mine? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and my true response in that was, First, thank you for having the courage to ask what everybody in this room is wondering, because <laughs> the, the proxy had just been listed, and they look at these numbers that are eye-popping. And, and on that one I talked about, it, there's a simple principle we use for salary, for you and for me, which is we do a market survey, and we look at what are jobs like that, what does it take to attract people, and that principle is what's used. I don't defend the absolute amount, it is eye-popping, but that's what the market bears and P&G chooses to be competitive. It's driven by a principle. He said, thank you, sat down, we moved on. And so directly answering questions that people want to hear makes a difference. And then global webcast, and in every country that I visit, we tend to take an hour and just do, for the people that are there, a Q&A session. The first part is harder because you have to actively try to get data. The filter that's in to be any large organization as you go up is heavy. And, and absent either having somebody go get the data for you or lowering the consequence of giving somebody feedback they don't want to hear, you're not going to get it. If I react in a way that's defensive, I won't get anything. And I do know, somebody told me the day that I got uh, appointed CEO was the last day of constructive, honest feedback I'd get. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, you're going to have to work hard if you really want to understand the impact the things you do, uh, the, the, it has on other people. And so I've had to work hard at that. I invite, you know, my, whether it's my leadership team, or you know, it could be partners in, in the HR organization to help me see the impact I have because we all need it. You know, it's tough to get constructive feedback. We all need it. We all make mistakes. We all need to learn and grow. And if we're truly in service to the organization, we, we view it as a gift. The reality is we only want the good gifts. <laughs> uh, but I try to create an environment where people can be direct. People send me a lot of emails. I actually personally respond to quite a few. Uh, and that then gets out. You know, David responded to a note, sent back. Thanks for sending it. It's a, it's a courageous question to ask. Here's, here's my view. And, and hopefully, you know, people will be more, on, more honest. But I recognize it's a filter. And I do want to just, the other thing I'd want to say, and then I, I certainly let Bill close, is you know, the, this institution and, frankly, the, the collective experience you're getting is, to me, remarkable. Many employers will, will comment on the, the students that come out of this organization, this institution. Uh, we feel very fortunate when we get a FUCA grad because they come not only with the intellect, but they come also with experience working with people. And, and those that really internalize this leaders of consequence, to me, uh, are just wonderful candidates to make a difference in our company very quickly. So I, I consider it you know, a pleasure to come and just share some thoughts with you uh, and understand the day you start at any company you'll make a big difference. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, David and Dean Balding. Uh, on behalf of the school, we wanted to give you a, a gift as a small good. token of our appreciation. Very good. Did you buy a lot of stuff from P&G to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, please join me in thanking David. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.